19 through 31. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send to my father's home. I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father, Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Would you remain standing for the Gloria Patri? You may be seated. you pray with me this morning. Gracious and heavenly Father, we do come before you striving to hear your word. So Lord, I ask that you would open up our eyes, open up our ears, open up our hearts to receive your message today and that the words that I speak now no longer be my own, but that they would be yours, Lord, your words for your people. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, welcome to our worship series, The Redemption of Scrooge. I'm looking forward to sharing this time with all of you as we look at this Charles Dickens classic story of second chances, of changing lives, and of redemption. Scrooge's life is a fascinating look into what the grace of God can do. No one, even Scrooge, 
is beyond the love and the saving grace of God. What a truly hope-filled message this is, especially for all of us. Well, we also welcome in this season of Advent and all that it means for us here, this season of preparation, of anticipation, and of keeping watch. We all wait for the news on that Christmas morning that unto us a child is given, unto us a child is born. But yet we also watch and wait for Christ's final return. We anticipate this arrival with joyful expectation. May we all remember to pause just a moment during the hustle and bustle of this season to reflect on what we are truly hoping for, what we are eagerly anticipating. Bah humbug. Scrooge's famous line, which is repeated in almost every story, every movie that is based on this classic tale. We all know people who act like Scrooge. We all wish that maybe we could change how they viewed life. I remember my years working in retail. I worked, I worked for a store called Venture. Some of you may remember those stores before they went out. I worked... Uh, worked at the store, and especially around the holiday season. It always was so busy and filled with angry people. I worked in the electronics department. Maybe that was why. You know, all the customers would come up, and of course, they would always want the newest Nintendo game. Of course, that was back with Mario Brothers and uh, some of those classic Nintendo games, Final Fantasy and, and some of those others. We were always out of them. I don't know why, but we were always out of them. And of course, they would complain about the store. They would complain about me. They would complain about the management. And of course, they would complain about the holiday. I always wondered how they became so unhappy, so grouchy. None of us are like that, right? Okay, maybe we have our moments. <laughs> Why does it seem like the holidays always bring out the worst in some people, along with the crazy? I guess we could see that this is a temporary thing. Many people who get this way during the season are not the same throughout the rest of the year, but some are. Here is where we find Ebenezer Scrooge. Fun fact, the word, the word Ebenezer That actually is a word that's found in a hymn. Hymn number 400. Come thou fount of every blessing. I think the line is, here I raise my Ebenezer. I don't think we're raising Ebenezer Scrooge. Uh, Really what it is, is it is speaking of a remembrance of some divine assistance. When God has helped us, we're remembering that help from ages past, and that is our Ebenezer this divine assistance that God has given us. You know, I think it sheds a little light into this character that we're looking at this Advent season in Scrooge. Well, before we get to that, let's take a look at Mr. Scrooge just a little bit. What can we say about him as we meet him? He's an old man, well in his years. He's greedy. He's trying to acquire all the money he can by all the means that he can. Scrooge is then stingy. He doesn't want to give any of his money to help the poor and the less fortunate. In fact, he's approached by a couple of of gentlemen looking for funds. They're looking for help for some, some of the poor and the less fortunate in the community. Scrooge has thought that it that it would be better if they just died. That would help the overpopulation, according to him. But you see, he also didn't want to help Bob Cratchit either. Didn't want to waste money on heating coal. Fires were kept at a minimum in the office, and therefore the office was cold all the time. Scrooge was angry. One of the lines from the story is, You keep Christmas your way, and I'll keep it mine. He didn't want it to be joyful. He wanted to remain alone and angry. Most people knew that, 
as they would keep their distance, even Christmas carolers out in the street would drop their sound really quiet when Scrooge would walk by, making sure that they didn't disturb him at all. Scrooge did, however, have one love in his life, money. His world revolved around it, how to get it, how to get more of it, and how to keep it all. Scrooge may have been knowledgeable in Scripture because he certainly takes Galatians 6-7 to the extreme. That passage says this, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also, <clears throat> that he will also reap. Most of his life was lived on this basis of reaping what you sow. If anyone... If anyone would have originated the phrase, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, I think that might have been Scrooge. It was all about him. It was all about helping himself. But you see, he forced that upon the world around him too. He thought that everyone could do the same if they just set their mind to it. Where they were in life was their own doing. If they focused their attention, they could accomplish anything as long as they didn't get in his way. Scrooge felt that life is all about how you control your own destiny. I remember one of the movie versions of this story, Scrooged, with Bill Murray. He's talking with his, at the time, girlfriend. She's helping at a homeless shelter, and he can't understand why she can't just leave so they can go out on a date, something that he had planned for them. He tells her this. He tells her, scrape them off, Claire. If you want to save someone, save yourself. So if Scrooge knew about Scripture, he would have cut a certain passage right out of his Bible. Matthew Chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. This is the story about the workers in the vineyard. Jesus starts this story by saying that the kingdom of God is like. And then the story provides a view into God's economy, into how God desires life to be. The master hires workers in the morning, agrees to pay them a day's wage. Then, throughout the day, he hires more workers at the third hour, the sixth hour, the eleventh hour. He hires them and tells them that he will pay them what is right. When it came time to pay all of his workers for the day, at the end of the day, after all the work is done, they all gather together to get paid, and he gives them all the same amount of money that he gave those workers that he promised the day's wage at the very beginning of the day. Now, I can only imagine if Scrooge were a young man and one of those first workers, what he might say. How can you do this? They didn't work as long as I. They didn't accomplish as much as I. You can't pay them the same amount that you paid me. I deserve more. I sowed more, therefore I should reap more. But you see, God's economy is not our economy. Thank you, Lord. We live in a world that values some of the things that Scrooge values. We live in a society that tells us that we need to save ourselves. That we need to scrape some of those things off and save ourselves. If we want a better life, then we need to go out and get it. Take what is rightfully ours. All I want is what I have coming to me. All I want is my fair share. Thank you very much, Sally Brown. <laughs> Thankfully, we are given a glimpse into God's economy with this story. With God, it doesn't matter when you begin to work for the kingdom, to sow seeds for the gospel. All that matters is that you begin whether it's the first hour, the third hour, the sixth hour, or the eleventh hour, you will be welcomed home as an adopted son or daughter into God's kingdom. 
If you need proof of this, just remember the thief on the cross next to Jesus. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus tells him, in this man's 11th hour, today you will be with me in paradise. That is good news. And this is all through the grace of God, not by anything that we do. And it's pictured in this story of workers because it didn't matter how much they worked or how much they accomplished, they all received the same amount. We all receive God's grace. And that is the thing about this grace of God. It's an amazing gift when it's offered to you. But boy, I tell you what, when it's granted to someone that we don't think deserves it, sometimes it's the toughest pill to swallow. But that's how grace works. It doesn't matter how much we do or don't do, or who we think deserves it or doesn't, God's grace covers all, regardless of how we feel about it. Now you may be thinking, what does this scripture lesson, what does our scripture lesson that I just had read a moment ago have to do with all of this? This passage from Luke. Well, follow me on this. Scrooge encounters four ghosts on this very short journey of his. Many times we think of it as only three. We think of ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future. But there were four. While we've been focusing on Scrooge this first week, and next week we'll be looking at both Scrooge and the ghost of Christmas past, we have to talk a little bit about the first ghost that Scrooge encounters, Marley. I think that Marley's ghost is a perfect depiction of the rich man in the story from Luke. What do we know about Marley? Other than Marley was dead, which is exactly the way A Christmas Carol begins. He was Scrooge's partner for many years until his death. So I guess we can assume that Marley was just as Scrooge was. That Marley is greedy and he's stingy and an angry old man who favored money over any relationship that he could have had. We could probably say that Marley didn't help the poor or the less fortunate and that he was the same mindset of Scrooge of being extremely self-centered. You know, I wonder sometimes how that office actually ran with the both of them in it. But you see, there are two big differences between Marley and Scrooge. One, Marley's dead. No escaping that. Two, Scrooge is getting a second chance. I guess we could say that the story, A Christmas Carol, is what would have happened if the rich man were actually given the chance that he asks for of Father Abraham in our scripture. He asks for a messenger to be sent to his brothers so that he may cha- they may change their ways. And here we find Marley returning to Scrooge giving him a dire warning that he does not want to end up like him, tortured forever in chains. Marley wants him to see things the way he sees them now. He wants Scrooge to recognize the effects of his actions before it's a little too late. He wants him to see the world through a different lens, through the lens that God offers to each of us, the lens of God's grace. In the Luke passage, the rich man realizes too late that how he has lived his life according to the world's lens is not the right way to live. It's too late for him, but not for those that he cares about. He becomes passionate about trying to save them, to warn them, to give them a second chance. Quick, Before it's too late, see it now. Don't waste another day, another minute, another moment. Don't waste another breath. Can you hear the urgency in his voice when he says, then I beg you, warn them, lest they come into this place of torment. The rich man is desperate, and he is begging and pleading with Father Abraham. Marley, too, is desperate. He wants to pull out all the stops to warn Scrooge of the way they both live their lives. Change now. It's not too late. It's not all about what you can do. 
how you can work or how you can save. If you don't help others, it doesn't mean anything. You can't take it to the grave. But how do we help? How do we reach out to others? Who are the others? This is the hard part. In our story from Scripture, we find in verse 26 a great chasm between the rich man and the one that the and all that he sees. Certainly, we can see this as speaking of the great space between heaven and hell. But I want you to see that there is just as big of a chasm at the beginning of this story. Verses 19 and 20. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores. What is this chasm that we see here? Money, social class, health? Sure, it could be all of those, but I think it's more basic than that. The gap that the rich man could not cross, the gap that many times we can't cross, is ignorance. We have placed a value on lives that is not in harmony with God's values. We placed a value on one life which demeans, or while we place value on this one life while demeaning another life. We feel that some lives are worth more than others. How is that possible? How can one person's life be worth more than someone else's? As humans, we've built this society based on value, and far too often we have everything backwards. God's society shows us that the poor man is worth more than the rich man, that the humble are valued more than the proud. The last will be first, and the first will be last. God's economy is opposite of everything that we know here. So how do we see those around us? Do we see people the way Scrooge saw people? As pawns to be used, as a way to get all that you want? Do we see people as different from us, lower than us, of not deserving of the same things that we have? How can we go forward seeing the world as God sees it? How can we see a world that is in need of, in, of the deserving grace of God? How can we see a world that is united in love, full of human beings that have inherent worth given by our Creator God? I hope that it doesn't take a visit from Marley's ghost to enlighten all of us to the grace of God in our lives. I hope it doesn't take a night of visitations to show you where you have been judgmental or demeaning or blind to those around you that need help. I hope that we can see that God's grace is for all people and it is a free gift given to all people. It's not something that you can earn, store up, hold back from others, or even get angry when people who you don't think deserve it receives it. Scrooge had a big problem with all of this. But he too can be redeemed. Even if we don't think he deserves it. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you knowing that there are times in our lives that we we feel that we have acted like Scrooge. Forgive us for all of those times and open our eyes and our hearts to, to notice the people around us. That they, like us, are deserving of your grace. This free gift that is given to all without cost. Help us to truly reach out to those and share that, share that gift of grace and to live our lives not as Scrooge, but as the people you call us to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.